Welcome to Design Your Life and Business, the podcast for leaders by Bright Mind Consulting Group. We give you the necessary tools to help you become the architect of not just your business, but your life too. I'm your host, Javon Wooden. Hey, Matt, welcome to Design Your Life and Business. How are you? Good. Thanks for having me. Hey, pleasure to have you on, man. I got to ask you, first question I ask every guest, who are you? Who is Matt Britton? Well, I mean, I don't define myself necessarily through my career. I find myself first as being a dad, a husband, a brother, a son, as well as an entrepreneur. I'm generally very passionate about building and creating things and responding to where the world is headed and trying to leave a lasting impact both in business and in my personal life. Yeah, I love that, man. How many kids? Three. Three? Oh, I'm entering the dad world now. Ours is due in December. So very happy. Baby girl, first one. Amazing. (laughs) <laughs> so maybe I'll get some tips on that after the show. Absolutely. <laughs> All right. So you said a lot when you said that you're really focused on moving the world forward in essence. So who would you say are some of your greatest role models and why? You know, I don't really think I necessarily I mean, have a role model. I mean, my dad was a role model for me just in seeing his work ethic and his value system. But outside of that, I don't really think I have a role model. I think I like to take little bits and pieces from everyone that I admire. Some people I think are incredibly creative. Some people I think maybe are great artists or writers. Other people are great motivators. And I try to take bits and pieces of those different people and try to form who I become versus trying to emulate after one person. For example, Michael Jordan never let his highs get too high and his lows get too low. Like when he won a game, you didn't see him getting too excited. When he lost, you didn't see him being too down. To me, that's something I took from him, right? And I try to stay level-headed and not try to be too frenetic about things that happen. And there's many examples of that that I try to emulate in my career. Absolutely. Yeah, that's perfect, man. And I like that because it's more focused on what they do versus the person themselves, right? So yes, yeah, exactly. Because everyone's flawed in some way. Exactly. So that's awesome. Wow, that's a great way to look at it. So you've done a lot and we're going to get into some of that. I want to know what drives you because you have more than motivation. You are driven. So what causes that? I just want to, I mean, a lot of things drive me ultimately. I mean, there's probably parts of me that want to prove people wrong. There are parts of me that want to see an idea come to fruition. Obviously, I have financial motivations. Trying to provide a better life for my kids is something that drives me. My employees and wanting to create a great work environment for them drives me, as well as the success of my customers. So I don't think it's any one thing. Again, I think it's a mix of a variety of different things that create the concoction of my ambition. And that's kind of like the championship mindset. You mentioned Michael Jordan, right? He always found something new to push him to those new heights. So it sounds like you do the same thing. I mean, that's kind of like the winning mindset as a whole, right? We all have to continue to have those new things and new rabbits to chase to keep us going as we hit different goals and come up with different aspirations. So for sure, man, for sure. And you've been this way probably your whole life, probably out of the womb, you were just like, hey, I need to get this done. (laughs) actually wasn't the case. I didn't really get motivated as an entrepreneur until I got to college. I was pretty much a mess in high school. Didn't really know what I wanted to do. Didn't really have motivation. I just don't think I had the emotional maturity to understand kind of my future. But then, you know, things started to click for me once I got off my own in the college. And then I started to kind of formulate an entrepreneurial spirit, which I think still lasts today. That's interesting because you straight out of college, you went to becoming a successful entrepreneur, making multi-million dollar exit. How? (laughs) How did you do that? What was the spark in college? So actually my first business out of college was called the Magma Group and it wasn't a successful exit. We did generate millions of revenues, but our revenues were from a lot of dot-com startups. And then going back to the year 2000, the dot-com bubble bursts and I got left with a slew of receivables, which we were never able to collect on as a business. And we actually had the, you know, we did sell the company, but it was more of a company just assuming our liabilities. I didn't really make much from it. It did get me to New York. So I think a lot of younger people look at others on Instagram and they think it's a smooth path to success. It normally isn't. There's usually lots of ups and downs along the way. That was definitely a down for me because we did have millions of revenues a couple years after starting, but our revenues weren't from the right types of customers. But that was sort of I needed to take early on and the learnings I needed to ascertain or early on to enable me to ultimately have the courage to start my first real business, which was Mr. Youth, later renamed MRY in 2002. Also, how did you overcome that 
you said you had millions in receivables that you couldn't collect on. How did you overcome that failure? I mean, I tried to focus on what was next. So what came out of that was, you know, when I started my business, I was in Boston at the time and then selling the business or having somebody assume the liabilities of the business got me to New York. And that was a completely new environment. And I was working for a company, which was essentially my first job ever, where I was working for somebody else. And, you know, I was really focused on what was next is kind of how I got past it. And there was a lot to be focused on, thankfully. It's not like I was just sitting around my house, you know, thinking about what had just happened. I had a new job. I was in a new city. I wanted to kind of, you know, start my life post-college because my first business was sort of like blending into my college life, if you will. So I think all those things made it somewhat easy for me to move on and look towards the future versus just kind of sit in the past and regret. Got you. And you mentioned getting you towards New York. Why was that relevant for where you are today? I mean, New York is the hub of media and Madison Avenue and advertising. So I just saw the most successful people that, or the people who I admired the most in my college life, all were heading to New York from Boston, where I went to school at Boston University. And given you know where all the large companies that I want to work with were there, it was just kind of a big leap. You know, they say if you can make it in New York, you can make it anywhere. Getting to New York was a big deal for me. Getting out of Boston was big because Boston, again, was more of an extension of my college life. And I wanted to kind of move on. And it was expensive and hard. And I didn't have any roots there. I grew up in Philadelphia. So getting to New York was a big thing for me. And I think I'm happy it, it did. I don't know if another business would have bought my first business. I might not be in New York. I'm still in New York 25 years later. Yeah, understood, man. And you mentioned you're a Philly guy. I don't know if you watch football. If you do, are you an Eagles fan? Come on, man. You don't know who you're talking to. <laughs> that's what I'm talking about. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> that's what I'm talking. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about, man. Hey, you see, I knew there was a reason why I wanted you on here. That's what I'm talking about. All right, perfect, perfect. Let me not get too distracted by the NFL because the season's coming up. <laughs> All right. What are some of the lessons you learned from that first, I'm not even going to call it a failure, but that first bump in the road, so to speak, when your company weren't able to fulfill that? I think that all revenue is not created equal. You know, you can go for, I mean, even today's analogy, there are a lot of companies who built a very thriving business on selling to companies in the crypto space or the cannabis space. And it was sort of like a gold rush, but now there's been a big shakeout. And I think like easy come, easy go. And I think then we were going after all these dot-com darlings, many of which didn't survive. And I think if you want to build a sustainable business, you need sustainable customers. So, you know, fast forward today and Susie, our customers are large multinational enterprise customers. So even in the wake of an economic downturn, they're not going to go anywhere. So I think that was ultimately the biggest lesson I learned is to really focus on having quality customers that can grow with you. That's a huge lesson, man. And it, it iterates. It's an iterative process. So how do you do that now? What was the process for you to say, okay, you know what? I'm going to get out all the noise and I'm going to focus on these subsets of people or companies. Well, I mean, it's more of an evolution where, you know, I can talk about my current business, but we early on saw when we launched Susie that we were building a product that really was built to meet the needs of large enterprises. So it's beyond just saying, I'm going to focus on larger customers. You need to build a product that meets your needs, which it means it has to have the right level of data security, has to have the right level of sophistication. It has to be something that can deploy it globally. So these large companies will want to you know, procure your product or service and use it for the long term. So, And then once you build a product that meets their needs, you really have to focus on building trust, on creating the right connections, on building your brand. So you can ultimately win in whatever space you play. And for some companies, it's focused on the, as small business is fine as well. It's just there's more churn in small business. So you have to have a, more volume. It's a different business model. You know, there are many very successful companies that have focused on small businesses, but they knew what they were getting into and they built a product around that subset. Absolutely. You said a few things. And one of the things I want to focus on is the branding piece. So what did it look like for you to develop a brand that the big companies wanted to even work with or entertain? It's about adding value. So building a brand isn't just your logo or the name of your company or your design, you know, aesthetics of, you know, the way your brand looks and feels to consumers. It's about the value that you offer. So for Suzy, we always try to add value towards our customers. And for us, value comes in the form of content. So we're constantly pushing out content that's very relevant to the industries that we serve to add value over time. And we don't ask for anything for the content. We just push it out, push it out, push it out. And over time, what happens is the people in those industries start to look at us as 
thought leaders and experts in that category. And then over time, they start to connect our brand with that thought leadership. And when you connect a brand with thought leadership and B2B, trust is created. And trust is ultimately what every brand wants to get. So that's kind of been our tried and true method in B2B. You know, in B2C, I would argue it's the same. You look at some great companies and the way they built their brand is through content, is through thinking about their end consumer and how to add value. And that's kind of the playbook that we've gone down. Absolutely. When it comes to like picking the right channel, say, for instance, you're B2B, maybe you go on a Forbes, an entrepreneur, you know, et cetera. So what did it look like to establish the relationships to get your content to those piece, those media outlets? I don't believe that traditional PR methods really work the same way as they did 10, 15 years ago. So when, you know, you mentioned Forbes or Entrepreneur Magazine or Inc or, that used, or New York Times, that used to be the way to get your message out. But now you can be a publisher on your own. You don't really need those brands. So when we create content, we're not publishing through traditional publications. We have a very sophisticated paid media engine where we're targeting our audience where they are in a very hyper-focused way. So they're just constantly seeing our stuff in their newsfeed. And over time, that's how they learn about us versus just hoping that a reporter is going to write the right thing about us in their magazine. That's not really the way that we go about building our brand anymore. Gotcha. And can you drill down a little bit on the paid media? Are you using something like Ascision or something like that, PR Newswire or something like that? Or No, I mean, we're using LinkedIn and Facebook and Google's networks to, to hyper-target the right people with the right content. Gotcha. Okay. So it's more so like maybe LinkedIn, like ads type of thing? Yeah, like advertising. Correct. Okay. Gotcha. Okay. I just wanted to make sure. We're trying to get into the news feed. Yeah. Understood. Okay. Yeah. And that's an important piece for the designers to hear because- I'm seeing a lot of people saying, hey, I want to get into Forbes. I want to get into these big known commodities, but it's not really doing anything because there's so much noise these days. So you kind of have to, you know, drill in and really focus and hone in on different platforms. That's a huge point because an organization like Suzy, you're doing it, man. You're, <laughs> you guys are doing it up. They're trying. Yeah, abs <laughs> absolutely. So what advice can you give about playing it safe versus taking risks? Well, I think ultimately... It's about whose money that you are playing with, right? Because when you talk about risk, you're risking two things. You're risking time and money, right? So if you're risking your own time and your own money, then maybe your risk versus return threshold is different than if you're risking somebody else's money and time. So I think, you know, with Suzy, the larger we've gotten, you know, the, the bigger the stakes, the risk return threshold is different with, say, later stage you know, investors like our last venture capital round, we raised over $50 million. And those are from late stage institutional investors who don't expect the same return, but they certainly don't expect to lose all their money. Where the initial seed investors of Suzy knew there was a chance they could lose all their money, but they also knew there was a chance that they could make a hundred times their investment, right? And then there's some entrepreneurs out there who didn't have to take any money. And with them, they're willing to risk it all because they can afford to lose it all where other people can't because they have a mortgage and they have a family and they can't. So I think ultimately it's about, you know, whose money, whether it's yours or other people's that are at play. And that can kind of drive the risk return threshold. The way that you execute on that threshold is a whole different strategy, which is, okay, if you're willing to take a lot of risk, what does that look like? Are you taking a lot of risk in terms of being a provocateur in terms of what you say and the way you look at the world? Are you willing to take a lot of risk in terms of building a product that no one's ever used before? And if they do, then you'll be the first and only, you know, but then there's also a high chance of failure. So it's not just about your risk return threshold. It's how you go about kind of executing it, if you will, which are decisions that any entrepreneur has to make. Absolutely. Now, when you say executing, are you executing in a vacuum? Did you, before you even got to the point you are now, did you have like a board of advisors to assist you? So with Suzy, we had a board of directors when every time you raise outside venture capital, you know, especially early stages, but really throughout every stage, you know, investors are likely going to want a board seat and they're likely going to want the governance of a board. That's very important for startups because it kind of holds the CEO accountable and doesn't let the founders kind of just run rampant and do whatever they want to do. Like the board is who I report to. Those are my bosses and they are holding me to a fiduciary responsibility to drive results. So we will, you know, tell them our strategy at the beginning of every year and update them each quarter. And with that strategy is, is financial forecasts and other metrics, but I'm held accountable for those. And I think over time, that's been a really great forcing function for me and our executive team to kind of hold ourselves accountable and not just make excuses and kind of reinvent what good is along the way. 
Yeah. <laughs> I think even if you haven't raised outside capital, I have a lot of friends who haven't raised outside capital, but they don't have a board. And what I see is those people, their blind spots aren't exposed. Like we all blind spots. There's always things that we do that are not great that we don't realize. Every human has that. And if you don't report to anybody, right, your employees aren't going to tell you because they're scared they don't lose their jobs. No one might tell you, right? Even like your spouse or significant other might not tell you because they don't see you in a work environment. And you could be going down a path where you have these huge blind spots and you think that everything's great until it's not. I think it's really beneficial for every leader to have people who aren't afraid to give them feedback and tell them what's really going on. 100% agree. Even if you aren't in a you know fiduciary responsibility type role, that's why I asked that about the board of advisors, because I know even smaller organizations, you should have somebody that's keeping it real with you to hold you accountable. And, and so, yeah, so I, I agree, man. Um, just so you know, I mean, Susie, now we have board of directors who I report to. We have a customer advisory board, which is made up of like senior level customers of Susie who give us feedback on our brand and our product roadmaps. And then we have a user advisory board, which is basically our power users who have hands on keyboard with our software product. And they're telling us about the user experience. And then a lot of my execs use a business coach so they can get feedback one-on-one -on -one outside of feedback I might give them. We have various forms of a very powerful feedback loop, which allows everyone to you know, understand their impact on others and keep improving. Now, I love that, man. Now, I got to ask you something dealing with you. So you have a large portfolio of interests and roles that you're juggling. You got a ton of people to manage, I'm assuming. How do you manage the workflow? So, I mean, I have like two parts of my workflow. I have like a consistent workflow and then I have a variable workflow. So my consistent workflow, first and foremost, is meeting with my direct reports at Suzy. I have weekly meetings or bi-weekly meetings with, I have seven direct reports of the company, you know, which makes up our executive team. And I'm meeting with them. And generally, the meetings go one of two ways. 80% of the time, it's what do you need to achieve your goals? How can I get out of the way? And maybe 15 to 20% of the time, it's you're not meeting your goals. Let's talk about why. Let's deconstruct it. Let's course correct. Let's go in the right place. And I think that's kind of the way those meetings work. And as long as everyone knows what success looks like, which I really make sure they do at the beginning of the year, then, you know, it really narrows down what those conversations are about. I also have, you know, quarterly board meetings and a variety of just kind of ongoing commitments that I have. And then I have variable things that fill up my schedule, whether it's customer meetings, speaking engagements, brainstorms to do product launches, or frankly, just things that pop up, problems that pop up that really acquire a disproportionate amount of my time that always happen from time to time. And that's kind of how my schedule is driven. And I would say it's probably 50-50 in that regard. Gotcha. And as a leader, you know, there's oftentimes probably that 10 to 15%, you have those tough conversations when they're not reaching or achieving their goals. What does that look like for your organization? What methodology do you typically lean into? So we have a really great human resources team led by our chief people officer, Anthony Anesto, who has kind of this whole performance framework that is put in place. And it's built to enable our team to understand where they stand, how they're performing at all times, to have a form for check-ins and for radical candor and to give two-way feedback. Ultimately, if I determine that somebody on my team isn't performing well, as driven by the metrics or just qualitatively, I see that things are going in the wrong direction. The first question I always ask myself is, is this person capable of writing the ship, right? Like, even if everything goes right, are they still the right person who I want driving it? Or are these issues they're facing emblematic of something more systemic, meaning they're just not right for the role anymore? Maybe the role's outgrown them, or maybe they aren't as focused on the role as they want to be. If that's the case, which what I've proven successful over time for me is then you just have to cut bait and you have to move on. I believe that. I think I've never in my career thought somebody wasn't right for the business. And then six months later, been proven wrong. I kind of always know. So really to trust your instincts in that regard, because you're not only helping your company, you're helping them because if they spend the next six months at your company where they have no upward mobility. They're wasting their time as well. So make that move. If you have determined that they are right for the role and it's just circumstantial, maybe it's my fault as a leader. I wasn't clear enough in the goals. Maybe they don't have the right resources. Or maybe there is just sort of a confluence of events which aren't really emblematic of the type of leader they are. Well, then we work to kind of identify the problem, 
course correct, figure out what the issues are, and then I will really handhold them and work very closely with them until they're back on track. That's the only time where I would be more of a micromanager is when I'm trying to right the wrong. On a day-to-day basis, for my execs that are performing well, I really stay out of their way. I let them you know, run their departments the way that they see fit. And I'm just there to make sure they have the resources and knowledge that they need to succeed. And I kind of just get out of their way. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's a key for everyone listening is, you know, because it's kind of hard to just stay out of the way, especially if you see something going on. You're like, well, you're never going to scale if you don't, you know? Yeah, absolutely. So what keeps you up at night? Well, I mean, I'm focused on health of me and my family, first and foremost. I mean, without that, you really have nothing. From a business standpoint, I want to make sure that we remain competitive. You know, the world is changing right now with all these AI innovations that are happening. And if you don't move fast on this, you definitely are going to put your company at existential risk. So what keeps me up at night and from a business standpoint is making sure that we are moving fast enough where we can continue to lead, but not too fast where we're being irresponsible or not listening to the needs of our customers. So I think that's ultimately, as a leader of a fast growing startup, the thing that kind of pops up in my mind at night always is, are we moving fast enough? Are we responding fast enough to things that are occurring in the business world. Absolutely, man. So what does the R&D process look like for you all? Do you just give them free reign and say, hey, go ahead and test this out? Or is it more control? Definitely more control. I mean, we're a larger business. I mean, when you're smaller, you know, it's a team of a couple of people, they can go in and change on whatever they want on the product. We have a very sophisticated product and we have to run every change we make through our legal and privacy team. We need to make sure our customer success team is aligned with any changes we're going to make on how it impacts our customer experience, even things like pricing and how you're going to price the new products. And ultimately, we have a finite amount of resources, even though we have a pretty large engineering team, to make changes in our product. So everything that we spend time on is something else we're not spending time on. So what we really try to do is create a framework of key drivers you know, strategic drivers for our ultimate goals every single year. And we essentially, when we come up with ideas, which we often do, we score each of those ideas against those key drivers. So if our drivers were growing big customers or retaining at-risk customers or getting into new markets or whatever it may be, then basically every idea would be force ranked against those drivers and it would spit out a score. And then that score helps us prioritize where we're going to focus uh, every quarter and every year. Yeah, I love that you all are so data driven because the numbers, they're not going to lie. <laughs> Absolutely. So otherwise, can you let recency bias come into play? You might just have gotten off a call with a customer who asked for this type of functionality and you're trying to appease them, but that customer might not even want it in a year or who's to say that the rest of your customers are going to want it. And you could build that, but then you're building at the risk of something else, which you could build, which could have 10x the impact. Absolutely. So- I got a question about the competitive analysis. Do you all even look at what your competitors are doing or you just say, hey, we talked to our customers, we did this? It's a great question. So I don't because I think it's a distraction and I would rather look at our metrics. And as long as our metrics are performing well, then competitors aren't impacting us. For example, like we demo our product and a certain amount of demos turn into deals. If that number started to drop off dramatically, well, maybe that would mean that what we are pitching or demoing isn't landing with the customer, which ultimately means that they're going another direction. And then that would force me to understand who that customer is and what they're doing or not. So I think you know, talk about being data-driven. I'm very data-driven with the way I look at our business. And as long as our unit economics or the math equation that is Suzy is playing out, then we just need to execute. And if it's not, I need to understand why. Now, our product team, you know, they are looking at what customers are building so they can see what's possible. So they could see different types of ideas. Our sales team could be looking at customers so they can know how to sell against the competitor. Like, how are you different than competitor X? But me as a leader, I don't really spend too much time focused on competitors. That makes perfect sense. You will get distracted and start, you know, being say, oh, we should do this. I like that. So the other question is, when you do get on those pitches, how do you land those pitches outside of the content marketing that you mentioned earlier? Do you do any outbound marketing? It's a process we have. Content marketing builds brand. It also allows us to generate what we call warm leads, which is when we push out content, sometimes we just push it out that's ungated. Sometimes we'll push out premium content that's gated, where people will have to enter their information to download the content. Once they've done that, we have an understanding of who they are and what they're interested in. And then we can have an outbound approach that's very contextual and relevant to them. 
versus just kind of, you know, spray and pray, so to speak. So that's been a really successful motion for us to win new business. We also have what's called an SDR team that is doing kind of cold outreach, which is successful to varying degrees. And then we just do a lot of events and a lot of networking with people who we know and customer referral programs, et cetera, to help us win new business. But ultimately, our biggest source of growth is expanding our existing customers versus winning new ones. We really focus on our share of wallet versus share of market with our existing customers and making sure that we're really embedding ourselves as really critical partners. That's a key because a lot of business owners and businesses out there, they're so focused on the new customers. So I want to kind of drill in on that, why you chose to focus more on the existing customers to increase the lifetime value of them versus obtaining new. Yeah. I mean, well, just given that we do focus on enterprise, a lot of these companies have hundreds of brands. So we can win one customer at a big house of brands, but then we have so many more to win. And we have a competitive advantage if they're an existing customer against most of the world because we are already approved. We're an approved vendor. So if you are calling to win a new customer, you're one out of a million tools or platforms or agencies that are trying to do business with this company. If we are calling to expand, we're one of a hundred, you know, companies that are actually approved. So the our barriers to expand are so much lower. You know, our competitive moat is so much greater that we can find that we could be a lot more efficient at expanding customers versus just going out and trying to get new ones all the time. Yeah. I mean, it's been proven that the cost per acquisition is so much higher than. (laughs) Yeah. And the same goes with focus on retention. You want to make sure that you're retaining your customers because the cost to replace them is dramatic. Absolutely. So I want to drill in on your leadership. How do you define effective leadership? What are some of the qualities you believe that a leader should have? I think you need to have charisma and be able to inspire and motivate people. I think ultimately, like, it's less about what you say. It's more about how you make people feel. So if I do a town hall or I'm speaking to new hires, people are going to remember how I made them feel. Did I make them feel inspired? Did I make them feel that there was potential? Did they make them feel motivated? Or did I bore them you know, or stress them out, right? How you make people feel is a direct correlation with how people will act in the future. I continue to make sure that that's an area where I think I definitely excel at because I'm a good speaker and I can motivate people and get people excited. I think that as a good leader, you have to be very goal-oriented and very metrics-focused. Everyone at the organization needs to be marching in the same step in terms of what success looks like at the end of the year. And how do those metrics, those overarching company metrics, boil down to each individual department and ultimately each individual employee? So how does every employee have a role where they can see the work that they do every day contributes to the broader goal of the company? And then you have to have a very high bar for talent in your company in terms of who you're bringing on. And part of that is making sure that when people, no matter how talented they are, but if they're bad for culture, right, getting rid of them, you know, you have to do that quickly. And all of that, those three things, you know, performance, talent, and the goals equal up to a winning mindset and a winning culture at a company. I think it's the job of a leader to, to really set those three things, put them all in motion, make sure there's clear communication and consistent communication in those areas. And I think that becomes a winning formula for success. Agreed. I think communication is everything. You got the speaking, but you're also a great writer. You actually have a New York Times bestseller called Youth Nation. So what is the top takeaway from that book? So Youth Nation was actually written now eight years ago. So time flies. I think the thesis behind the book is still relevant today. Maybe not the examples because the world has you know, changed, but ultimately... It's about the flipping of the script where it used to be that big companies were in control of the future of business, culture, and society because they controlled all the communication channels. You know, before the internet, as long as you had a checkbook, you could have commercials on mainstream television and that would be the voice people heard, right? And they used to be in control. And what's happened over time with the power of the internet, more specifically social media, is that now consumers are in control. And the consumers that are really driving the future of business and culture and society are generally the young consumers who disproportionately adopt new technologies to change the world. So young people now are in kind of the driver's seat of where business is headed and companies need to kind of take heed and listen to younger consumers and understand their way of thinking, which is largely much different than the way of thinking of a lot of people who are in the C-suite. And the biggest reason why is that you know, the millennial generation was the first generation to grow up with the internet in the household. And many people who are Gen Xers and baby boomers who are still in the C-suite didn't, and they think differently. And often their decisions are driven by a different way of thinking. 
And, you know, that will lead them down the wrong path. Absolutely. And another thing I'm seeing in the younger generations are they're more socially conscious. You know, they're focused on social causation. So now you're seeing a lot of organizations, you know, instead of talking about the product they're presenting, you're seeing commercials on the cause that they're supporting. So everything has changed and could be something that Susie is probably looking at. So with that being said, how does Susie convey their social cause? How does Susie keep up with what's going on from that perspective? I mean, we have a fantastic, as I mentioned, HR and chief people officer in our company who really listens to, like, ultimately, if you're talking about being cause oriented and focus on things that are beyond the business, it's really about what our employees believe in, right? And that's not always easy to grab consensus when you live in the world that it's key, but it's hard to execute in the world where, you know, you have a country that's really largely divided. And, you know, if we have a company that's full of employees on both sides of the political aisle, Sometimes it's hard to get behind causes that will gain consensus. And then you get into this game of having leadership pick what's best, which could often, you know, create a lot of internal strife and go against all the performance-based cultural initiatives and ultimately hurt business. So it's not easy in this world because what I think is right, what you think is right, you know, 40% of America or 50% might think is wrong. But, you know, those people are also your customers. Those people are also your employees. So the question is how far do you lean in to that? Is that the role of the company or is that the role of an individual? And even if I believe it's the role of the company, I have investors and those investors expect a return. You know, so I could tell my investors, well, I'm doing the right thing, but we missed our numbers. And they'd say, well, we don't care because they have investors. So my investors have other investors they need to appease. So it's not always easy. That's why some people to the outside, you know, for example, I have a podcast myself and I interviewed the head of Adidas, who, you know, had to make the decision on pulling the, the Yeezys from Adidas. And so many people like, well, why didn't Adidas pull it sooner? Why didn't they pull it sooner? But if you really peel back the layers, there are so many different people that were affected by them pulling that off the shelf. Maybe it made sense to other people to do it right away from the outside. No one really knows what's going on on the inside. So you have to kind of, I guess, weigh the outside perception and the outside generally has limited information with the realities of your everyday life to make decisions on where to lean in from a social cause standpoint. Absolutely. Especially when you're talking about billions upon billions of dollars <laughs> that is getting pulled with that product. So I wholeheartedly agree. Yeah, I would. I have to watch that one because I'm sure that was an interesting conversation. Are you planning to write another book since Youth Nation was eight years ago? I've thought about it many times. Right now, I'm just so knee deep with Susie in startup land. And, and we have such a big opportunity that it's just about time. And I don't have any plans in the foreseeable future just because I think, you know, Susie is a very special opportunity. Many entrepreneurs will go a full lifetime, a full career building businesses that won't get to the scale that we're at, that won't have the potential that we have. And I just want to take advantage of it. So, so much of what I do is really focused on really maximizing the success. And I believe right now writing a book would take away from that just because there's so much time involved in it. So not right now. I do try to publish content whenever I can on LinkedIn and other channels. So I'm still kind of scratching my writing itch, if you will. But writing a book is kind of a whole different thing to take on. Understood. Before we get to our by design segment, I got to ask you, you mentioned earlier that you were really focused on health. So with all that you have going on, especially with running a startup, how do you maintain your health, mental health, especially? It's not easy to do. You know, so you asked me what kept me up at night. It doesn't mean I'm doing a good job at that. You know, I think that I go in ebbs and flows where sometimes I feel like I'm really taking care of myself, my health, physical health, and other times not so much. Mental health, it's really just about balance. It's about making sure that I have enough time away from the screen and I'm outside, make sure I have enough time away from work and with my kids or doing things I like. And I think if I have enough balance and I really also don't let you know, the stressful moments get to me too much by having that level head. I think that's how I generally gauge mental health. Physical health requires a little bit more discipline in terms of how you spend your time and the things you put in your body, et cetera. And I have varying degrees of success with that. <laughs> Don't we all, man? Don't we all? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Absolutely. Some people could just turn it on and get it, like, and get it and be super disciplined. Others can't, you know? Yeah. For me, it takes a lot of focus. So I'm with you, Matt. <laughs> All right, we're going to go to our by design segment where I ask every guest the same three questions. You ready, man? I'm ready. All right. First question is, what has been the hardest part about designing a life and business you don't need a vacation from? The hardest part is 
I think finding balance and making sure that you're enjoying your life and staying happy and not letting your business define you. Because when you're running a company, you're supposed to be all in. But if you're all in, that means that there's nothing of you that's not in it, which then by definition can take away from who you are as a person. So I think that's definitely been the hardest part. That was beautifully said. All right. Number two, what is the best lesson you've learned on your entrepreneurial journey? The best lesson I've learned is to focus on the value and importance of a network. Ultimately, if you're getting a new job or you're starting a business or you are going through a tough time, it's your network, the people who you know and trust and who know and trust you, they're going to be your best asset. And I think often people make the mistake of just focusing on the people who can help them at that moment, but not focusing on the big picture of building a sustainable network over time and hang on those, to those relationships. And if you can do that and you can establish a very high quality network who, you know, there's a two-way level of trust and value that's going to pay off time and time again. Absolutely. Now I've got to ask you 2A because you mentioned networking. So how do you establish that network that's actually genuine connections? So I think it's harder to do later in life. I think earlier in life, you're in your career, you're out more, you know, you have your new people who you meet at college, you have people who you meet you know, at your jobs and you're usually switching jobs a lot more early in your career and you start to collect a network. And I think what people probably don't realize is you're going to create the most amount of connections you have in your twenties and thirties and in your forties and fifties, generally the new relationships you have tend to be more transactional, you know, just like you meet less close friends later in life. So I think now it's about making sure that nurturing the connections I have later in my career where earlier in my career was about trying to make as many new connections as possible. All right. Thank you. The third question is, what are three tools or tips that you will recommend when scaling a business? And you know a lot about this one. I think it's understanding how these programmatic ad platforms work like LinkedIn and Facebook and Google, because your ability to really define who your target is and get your message out by hitting a button is really incredible and something that didn't exist 10 years ago and really can help companies quickly build their brand. I think that's one. I think other tools, I mean, you know, we love using tools that allow us to really have our finger on the pulse of the dashboard of our business, all the metrics and this kind of scorecard. So we use a tool called Cluster, K-L-U-S-T-E-R, that really allows us to have an, a real-time dashboard of how our company is performing. So I find that really impactful. And I guess the third tool that I use personally is called Pocket which really allows me to take any piece of content that I'm reading and kind of have a repository for it, which I can always access because I'm always reading new stories, whether it be on Twitter or New York Times or you name it. And then I want to make sure that I can kind of reference that in the future and go back to it. And this tool Pocket's really been great for me to do that. Absolutely. Yeah, I use Pocket as well. I've been using it for years, so I'm glad you mentioned that. I I forgot about that almost. (laughs) Thanks so much, man. It's been a pleasure speaking with you. You dropped a lot of knowledge and a lot of different topics. Appreciate you uh, dealing with all my fast fire questions. No, they're great questions. (laughs) Thanks, man. How can people connect with you? You can go to my website, mattbritton.com, or to learn more about Suzy, it's S-U-Z-Y.com. Awesome, man. Well, just keep ascending. If there's anything I can do for y'all, keep me in mind and Yeah, I'll be sure to contact you and stay in contact and watch what you're doing. Please do. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much, man. Talk soon. Design Your Life and Business, the podcast for leaders, is brought to you by Bright Mind Consulting Group. To find out more about Bright Mind Consulting Group and how you can become the best leader possible, visit brightmindconsultinggroup.com. Make sure you search for Design Your Life and Business on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, or anywhere else podcasts are found. Click subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. On behalf of the team here at Bright Mind Consulting Group, we cannot thank you enough for listening.